Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Zwerf Buffy Bocconi Meet the Author webinar. This Meet the Author webinar marks the publication of Jon Danielson's new book, The Illusion of Control, Why Financial Crises Happen and What We Can or What We Can't Do About It. This book is highly relevant for anybody interested in financial stability since it exposes weaknesses of current approaches to predicting financial crises and it explores avenues to improve financial regulation and supervision in the future. Let me give a warm welcome to the author, Jon Danielson, Director of the Systemic Risk Center at the London School of Economics. Jon, thanks for sharing your insights today with us. Thank you so much for having me on. A discussion becomes interesting only when a mind of at least equal capability evaluates and reflects upon the arguments put forward. We're extremely privileged to have with us today Hyun Song Shin, economic advisor and head of research at the BIS. You all know Hyun as an intellectual leader in the fields of banking, international finance and monetary economics. Topics on which Hyun has published widely, both in leading academic journals and in official publications. Finally, it is a particular pleasure and honor to have with us today Elena Carletti, full professor of finance at the finance department of Bocconi University and also a SWERF fellow. Elena will guide us through the event today and moderate the discussion. Without further ado, let me now hand over to Elena. Thank you, thank you, Ernest, and good afternoon to everybody. I'm very pleased to be here and to chair this discussion, which I'm sure will be very interesting. I look at the slides and the book of John, and I found very interesting and very timely, of course, given the current situation we are also experiencing or about to experience again. So without further ado, let me give the floor to John for his presentation and then to you for the comments, and then we can open the discussion. John, please, you can start. Thank you so much. It's a true pleasure to have a chance to 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 return to SWEF. I've been in many events in the past and it's always, always been enlightening, always been good. And I'm so happy that you chose to invite me for this book presentation on the book that just came out with Yale University Press a couple of months ago. Being sort of a formal economist, let me start by defining what I think is the control problem in financial regulations. And I'm thinking about from the point of view, the regulator, not the private sector in this talk. So I think sort of the objective of regulations should be the maximization of economic growth, subject to uh, protecting the uses, of course, macro proof, micro proof, and avoidance of too many costly crises, macro proof, along with other constraints such as equality and the environment. So I at least view the primary objective as growth maximization. And in what follows, when I talk about risk, I am referring to systemic risk that is a chance of really bad outcomes, not for day-to-day -day events unless otherwise indicated. So to make this a bit more formal, the relationship between risk appetite and the macroeconomy on the empirical level as distinct from the theoretic literature is really difficult to establish. So I looked at a huge number of papers because I just have one that came out on the subject. But what we find is that when market participants perceive risk is high today, they immediately act in a way that hurts economic growth immediately. While if they perceive risk to be low today, they act in a way that boosts economic growth this year and next year, but with an overreaction uh, two years hence. But overall, the impact of a perception of low risk is good for the macroeconomy, with a single exception when credit growth has been excessive, like it was before 2008, even then the overall impact is negative. And the channels for this empirically is capital flows and investment. And I guess no surprise, global risk appetite is much, much more important than local risk appetite with the United States about one third of the global risk appetite in this context. 
So risk matters. So how can we think about risk? So imagine a hypothetical distribution of financial market outcomes from the bad losses to the good, big, nice profits and, and high growth. So suppose this is the distribution of outcomes. And if we map the policy objective onto that distribution, we want to shift the distribution from the red to the blue. We want to make the th lower tail, the bad tail thinner, reduce the likelihood of bad outcomes and make the upper tail, the good outcomes faster to make such outcomes more likely. So in a way, a formal way to, th to state what the policy objective of risk is, is to shift from the red distribution to the blue distribution. Now, how do we actually achieve that? And depending on whom you ask, you get very different answers. If we ask the authorities, they tend to blame risk-seeking uh, bankers for all chasing yield without regard to risk or anything else. And eventually they take so much risk that they run over a cliff and everything comes crashing down. But if you ask the private sector people, they say the opposite. They say that the regulators are only looking at the surface. Well, and if everything's okay on the surface, everything is fine, even though the forces of financial crisis and bad outcomes are all hiding just slightly out of sight. Now, which of this true or even both is something I will discuss today. And there are three dimensions I have in approaching the problem. And the first is how to measure risk. Now, I am slightly conflicted. A few years ago, I wrote a book called Financial Risk Forecasting. So, and I teach a course in LSE with a couple of hundred students every year. And I think uh, some tens of thousands of students around the world use this book. So clearly this is, so, so clearly I believe risk must be measurable. But, and there is a big but. Imagine the problem of keeping your office temperature controlled. Your office has a th thermometer. And if the thermometer says the heat is above 21 degrees, you turn on the air conditioning. And if the temperature goes below 21 degrees, you turn on the heat. There's an automatic virtuous feedback between the thermometer and the thermostat, which controls the temperature in your office. And I think a lot of people think the same type of device exists in finance, a riskometer which you can plunge deep into the bowels of Wall Street, like in the figure you had in front of you, that riskometer measures systemic risk. And by having that risk measure, you can fine tune the desired risk in the financial system, just like you can fine tune the risk in the, or the temperature in your office. And when I wrote about the first time, I called it the myth of the riskometer because this riskometer doesn't really exist in reality. So if you, if you repeat the slide with a desired distribution shift, we, we go from the red and we want the blue. What is the problem in achieving that? Well, the problem is the data lives in the middle of the distribution well, what we care about lives in the far left and the far right tail. So we have practically no observations about the event we care about. Instead, we have plenty of observations, all the trillions of observations about the financial system, but they all live in the middle of the distribution, not in the tails where things we care about. So then, and you do know, at least those of you who have done this yourself, you know what happens. We measure the middle part of the distribution and project to the tails. But that is not really, that doesn't really work well. Because to begin with, unlike temperature, risk is latent. So technically speaking, you cannot measure market risk or financial risk. You can only infer it by how much prices have moved in the past. And that means to do so, we have to create a risk model. And that risk model is fed with day-to-day -day or high-frequency rate data. And we then 
sort of wave our hands and project that to the tails. But technically, we have no idea of how to do the projection from the middle of the distribution to the tails. And that means, in practice, measures of financial risk are never very accurate. So, imagine risk lives on a scale from 1 to 10. At best, a risk measure has a one-digit precision, not two digits, and certainly not five, two or five or six digits. So if we can say risk is two, we cannot say risk is 2.36. Couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a risk consultant, and he had just walked, uh, just came back from a large international bank, and he was told that that bank wants all risk numbers to be reported to seven digits. And he said he started laughing. And the people in, had a meeting, they got embarrassed and they said, yeah, we know this is stupid, but this is the order from above. But you cannot do that. And Warren Buffett said this really nicely a few years ago. He said, we don't like things you have to carry out to three decimal places. If someone waited more than three hundred to three hundred fifty pounds, I wouldn't need precision. I would know they were fat. And therefore, at the very least, we should recognize the limits to the accuracy of risk measures. And I think everybody, and I mean everybody who produces a measurement of risk, systemic or otherwise, should provide a confidence bound. I do not trust a risk forecast that does not come with a confidence bound around it. So the first ingredient in the control problem is the measurement problem. The second is what causes risk, what causes systemic risk. I think all major systemic events, all major tail risk is at its core political. The 2008 crisis, Brexit, Trump, Venezuela today is a major financial crisis entirely caused by politics. And the reason is that it is politics that allows the risk to emerge in the first place and politics that prevents, prevents timely solutions. If we take perhaps the major existential crisis today in the environment risk, the inability to deal with or address environment risk is political and so is the other major risk factor today, demographics. And Dealing with such risks requires the political leadership to do something. So I think the main driver of systemic risk is politics, not excessive private risk taking. But that has some implications for the financial authorities. So can a non-political entity like a central bank legitimately address macroprudential concerns that arise from democratic outcomes? So in the United Kingdom, we have some we have some precedent. During the Brexit campaign half a year ago, the Bank of England and the governor at the time, Mark Carney, repeatedly warned against the economic consequences of Brexit. For its troubles, it got severely attacked in the press. And at one point, the bank was forced to seek approval from the prime minister at the time who was a former Bank of England employee, to tell the bank it had her full confidence. Just this morning, we are, we are reading about how the government is attacking the Bank of England, blaming it for inflation. And now what we are reading is that the Bank of England is really paralyzed because all the economic analysis says raise interest rates, all the political pressure says do something else. So how can a how can a central bank cope in such an environment? And I would think the probability of the banks of England independence being curtailed by legislation is certainly not zero. There is some chance that the government will legislate against the bank because politically it is increasingly being blamed for the inflation and cost of living crisis. So if the financial authorities cannot incorporate political risk in their analytic frameworks, how effective can they be and how legitimate are they? And that takes me to the third ingredient in this, which is where risk arises. 
So any of you who have created a risk forecast method or a riskometer, this is how riskometers see risk. It is as if an asteroid hits the city of London, just like the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Certainly, the dinosaurs did nothing to cause their demise. But what drives risk? Well, the time between decisions and losses is long. The crisis in 2008 did not really happen because of anything done then. It happened because of decisions made years earlier. Let's say 2003. In 2003, every indicator of risk said risk is low. I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can find an indicator that said otherwise. And that meant both the authorities and the private sector and everybody else says, oh, we are, we are safe. And because we are safe, it's okay to take on extra risk. But of course, then the crisis happened, bringing back Minsky, who told us 50 years ago, stability is destabilizing. Because we thought risk was low in 2003, we endogenously behaved in a way that caused a crisis half a decade later. And risk comes in many forms. And while we tend to think of risk as being a uniform type thing, it certainly isn't. So imagine this afternoon that the US stock market goes down by 200 billion today. I don't think many people would care all that much. But 15 years ago, potential and not even real subprime losses of 200 billion and a global crisis ensued. The difference is the risk we know we prepare for. That's the known unknowns. The unknown risk is the most damaging, but the problem is the risk we measure and the risk we control is the known unknown because that's all we end up seeing. To make this formal, Hyun, who is with me, on, with me on the panel today, and I, some 20 years ago, we proposed a classification of risk into exogenous and endogenous risk. Exogenous risk arises to the system from the outside, like the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 years ago. And certainly, just like the dinosaurs were not at fault for causing their own demise, so the person in the system or the institution receives the risk but doesn't cause it. Endogenous risk is the other side. It says risk that is created by the interaction of the people who make up the system. And here rules play a crucial role because all market participants are guided by myriad of rules. And a lot of those make them short term dictate myopia. Capital, mark to market, margins, leverage constraints, just to mention a few, they drive us to the short term, especially in crisis. And market prices do not follow random walk in the ad most adverse states of nature because that's where the constraints bind would dictate behavior. So all these well meaning rules. They also make us short term in the time of extreme turmoil, therefore driving crisis. And I think it's the interaction of human beings that creates endogenous risk. All these human beings with their own objectives, abilities, resources, and biases. And ultimately, it is a prudent self protection instinct of market participants that drive crisis dynamics. So all market outcomes are endogenous. Now, some empirical evidence to plug into this. A few years ago, I did a paper on risk perceptions in crisis. And what we find is that low risk predicts crisis up to 10 years into the future, while high risk is a contemporaneous consequence of stress, not the cause, which means empirically that the VIX, high risk, CDS spreads and the like, they are useless as indicators. They can't predict. They just tell us that things are bad, which we already know. To make this slightly more formal, imagine a hypothetical price bubble. On the x-axis, we have time. On the y-axis, we have outcomes. 
and prices they go up faster and faster and faster and then crash and this is a typical bu price bubble we say the prices go up the escalator and down by the elevator the way we measure risk by and large it means that risk goes down as we go up the bubble so at the same time risk is up, is perceived as falling and prices are going up as in 1980s pop song has it money for nothing but this is illusionary part of the illusion of control because the actual underlying risk goes up with the bubble and down with the bubble so i would contend that measured risk is negatively correlated with the actual risk that drives the system so therefore are, are those of us who are thinking about controlling the system the risk dashboard might tell us everything is fine because everything flashes green while the endogenous risk monster is hiding behind us waiting to strike so given these three planks what can we do so let me restate the policy objective this is maximize growth subject to uh, risk and other things but the objective of policy is not to de-risk it is not financial stability it is not compliance it's not reporting those are only instrument to meet our objective again growth and in that those tasked with making decisions they are faced with a trilemma they can pick stability efficiency or uniformity you, you can only pick two not three and what do we tend to pick we tend to pick efficiency and uniformity why is that well anything that drives financial institutions or makes them more similar in outlook and action goes against the object, our objective. The regulations, by and large, work towards harmonizing beliefs and action, level playing fields that increase increased the fixed cost of complying. They just lead to increasing returns to scale. And I think the thrust of regulation since 2008 has been on the control of the measurable, not what matters. And after all, the financial system is, in effect, infinitely com complex. So whatever you tr control, you try to put on the system, you only address a small part of the action space. And I promise you, there will be another crisis, and it will happen when nobody is looking. So I think it's better to give up uniformity. Be more heterogeneous you make financial institutions, you increase the shock absorption capacity of the system. A shock comes along, somebody sells, somebody buys, in aggregate, creating a random noise. The more similar institutions are, the more you're driven to the left or to the right tail. So heterogeneity among institutions is automatically stabilizing. That also means financial services are better tailored to the user and the cost of regulation should be lower, both of which should help with economic growth. So I think ultimately the way to address the illusion of control is to create diversity in the type of financial institutions we have. So how can we do that? Well, conceptually straightforward. We can actively encourage financial institutions to be different from each other. We can regulate them differently depending on what they do. We can eliminate barriers to new entrants, especially new entrants with new business model. That means embracing financial technology and decentralized finance, perhaps via CBDCs, and recognizing that shadow banking is not necessarily the enemy. What prevents this? Well, first is our innate conservatism. We prefer what we know instead of what is new. And for those who make decisions, there's a lot of risk aversion because collective failure covers individual failure. So long as a crisis happens and everybody does the same, we are not at blame and our institution is not to blame. 
and finally lobbying because the incumbent financial institutions, especially the largest banks, they prefer the existing setup. All of this is easily solvable with political will. So, have we achieved our objective? Mark Carney, then the chairman of the Financial Stability Board and governor of the Bank of England, said four years ago, over the past decade, G20 financial reforms have fixed the fault lines that caused the global financial crisis. I don't quite buy that. And the reason is what we want to control risk is not measurable, especially not the risk that matters most endogenous risk. Empirically, instead of theoretically, empirically, we only have a vague idea of the relationship between risk and the macroeconomy. It is very difficult to verify ex post that a bad outcome results from too much risk or a, rather than a bad draw from an acceptable distribution. And therefore, when we see bad outcomes, the tendency is to shrink the action space, reduce risk, rather than recognize the problem could be different. But you can't verify these, neither ex ante nor ex post. And I think the main driver of instability, which is politics, is beyond the control of the political authorities. So what is the illusion of control? The illusion of control is believing that we have set up a system of control that helps us to meet our social objectives, growth with few or no costly crisis. There's no need to worry about things. And that means we can go about our business feeling protected. And I think with that, I thank you so much for listening and I will pass it on to Elena again. Thank you, John. This was a fascinating talk. I have uh, already many um, questions I would like to ask, but I will uh, wait for a uh, comment first. But maybe one aspect that, so I, I, mean, I see your talk as divided in three main initial parts, which is the objective of financial regulation. What is it that we want to achieve? And I think it's important to state it and state it again, because although it should be obvious, I think sometimes indeed, as you say, we see financial stability as the objective, while it shouldn't be, it should rather be economic growth. And my impression is that sometimes we tend to instead focus too much on stability, disregarding what we are missing out by focusing so much on stability, precisely in terms of economic growth. So these missed opportunities for growth that sometimes we, we have because of this big emphasis on financial stability. The second one that I think as I was saying before, it's really time, is the issue of political risk. Because this is not just a problem for regulators, this is also a problem, of course, for the financial system itself. But how does the financial system deal with the political risk and incorporate the political risk? Because all risk management is based on historical data, as you also said, in a way. And therefore, political risk is something that comes completely unexpected. So it's completely outside of the typical risk management way of, um, of, of working. And then this endogenous risk, exogenous risk, and then from there, what we are doing. So just uh, before Yuna gives uh, his comment, just one clarification at this stage, I understand Ukraine, I understand many other situations have been caused by the political, to some extent, the COVID, if you want, although it maybe it's more debatable. But I missed to see the 2008 why crisis, why was it really caused by political risk? We can say political, political maybe was reacting to the crisis, not in the way it should have done. But why was the cause of the crisis that I missed a little bit? I think you are on mute. There is a fantastic book by Charlie Calamiris on that very topic. So he wrote, he wrote, I think, the best book on the 2008 crisis I've read. And what he said is that was at the root of the crisis was a political alliance between left-wing political advocates for the poor who wanted the housing and right-wing pro-market entities that wanted to allow banks to concentrate. So therefore, the objection to what was happening in the system was muted by the left-wing because the system was meeting its special objective, which is to make subprime mortgages. So the price of allowing bank mergers and high risk was the alliance with the left wing 
force a prime and the inability of the financial authorities or the Fed to regulate all the structured credit products at the time was because both the right wing and the left wing of the political spectrum in the United States came together to prevent any action. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm deciding Charlie Calamiris' argument here, but I found this, to my mind, this is the most convincing argument mm. for 2008. No, no, okay. I was thinking of political risk as something really much more exogenous to the financial risk, if the financial system, if I may mm. say it this way, like the war or COVID, something much more outside. This is a little bit is the development of financial regulation, what you are, what you are uh, referring to. That may be induced by political consideration, but is within the financial system more than an exogenous uh, yeah. uh, situation mm -hmm. like the war or something like that. Okay. Let me stop here and let me get now go to uh, you, please. Thank you, Elena. Um, thanks, John. Uh, it's great to be on this panel. Um, and uh, reading John's book really brought uh, very good memories uh, of my time at LSE, which I still think is uh, was uh, some of my uh, most productive years. Um, and uh, you know, John is very kind to refer to some of our collaborations. And needless to say, um, I have a lot of sympathy, you know, with the arguments. And I re really would highly recommend this book because. Um, there are lots of interesting anecdotes, uh, lots of gems. So what I thought I'd do, actually, um, rather than you know giving you very broad um, sort of generalities, is if I uh, just amplify on the notion of endogenous risk that uh, that John outlined. Uh, I hope you can see this. Thousands came to see the opening of the first new river crossing in central London for a hundred years. The Millennium Bridge, spanning the Thames in a sweeping arc from St Paul's Cathedral to the newly opened Tate Modern Gallery, is expected to carry four million pedestrians a year. But today, the numbers proved overwhelming. Within minutes of the opening, the bridge was swaying under the sheer weight of sightseers. I think it's marvellous, but uh, it doesn't have sway. It's like being on a ship. I didn't expect it to move that much, but um, now that I'm getting used to it, it's fine. Sweet. <laughs> Moving. Most took it in their stride, others voiced their concerns to police who closed the bridge while they consulted safety experts. The bridge's designers say it was built to allow some movement. Organisers of the opening say 100,000 people have tried to cross here today. Even with restricted access, the bridge is still swaying, though engineers have reassured police that there's no safety risk. Daniel Bircher, BBC News, on the Millennium Bridge, Central London. You saw that, uh, you know, it had this... Um... Uh, problematic opening where uh, you could see that uh, the bridge was, uh, you know, swaying from side to side. Let me show you another video. Just labelling anything Millennium seems guaranteed to bring controversy and embarrassment, even if, like the Millennium Bridge, its popularity isn't in doubt. People queued for up to half an hour today to be allowed over the bridge 300 at a time. Were they disappointed? They were not. It wobbled. It wobbled so much in places, people clung to the side rails as if they were at sea. Others thought it was like walking down the middle of a moving train. Are you holding on? It seems to be swaying. Not that bad, is it? Well, it seems bad to me. Really beautiful. I can feel the, um, the bridge move a little bit. But um, well, it's just so, so innovative. The aluminium and steel arch from St Paul's to the South Bank cost £18 million. The vibrations seem worse towards the south side. Engineers call what's needed now damping, a kind of shock absorbing. But it's crudest and most unsightly, that might mean hanging a weight from the bridge into the Thames. But engineers favour more discreet damping, which they'll try to hide underneath the arch. We don't actually know what is wrong. We have not looked in our calculations and found a mistake and gone, oh God, we forgot to divide this by two or something, right? There is nothing like that in, 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 in issue. So another attraction wins public approval and then closes, perhaps for many weeks. The engineers behind this bridge are embarrassed by how much it wobbles, a phenomenon they hadn't bargained for and admit they don't fully understand. You know, what had happened was that uh, they opened uh, this landmark um, in London. As you can see, this is a very sleek design. It's a pedestrian bridge. It's the first river crossing uh, on the Thames for uh, many, many years when it was opened. 
It's a very innovative design. It's a lateral suspension bridge. Of course, the designers that had subjected uh, this design to lots of stress tests. So just as we stress test credit books, just as we stress test in the way that we would do, we would actually sort of imagine um, a storm. We would imagine a, a very heavy load crossing the bridge, even though it's a pedestrian bridge, perhaps, uh, you know, a tank might, uh, you know, go on it and it might sort of trundle along. And it passed all those stress tests. But there was something weird going on in that um, this was swaying quite badly. So what they did was they, they closed the bridge and it's, it was to remain closed for about 18 months. And they took a, and they brought a shaking machine and they shook the bridge uh, and they changed the frequency. Um, and the trouble was exactly at one hertz. So one cycle per second. So it's only when you shook it at one hertz that this characteristic uh, swaying actually arose. Now that was a clue because, you know, walking, typical walking pace is around two steps per second. So you're on your left foot uh, every second, you're on your right foot every second. And that was exactly the, the frequency at which uh, the problem was arising. And the question is why was the, the sideways movement? Now it's true that when we walk, most of the force is exerted downwards. You know, that's, that's gravity for you, but because our legs are slightly far apart. So, you know, it's not as if we're like a unicycle, um, you know, we do have, uh, legs on either side. And so there's also a slight sideways force of around 25 Newtons for, uh, for a typical, for, uh, for a typical person. But then you say, well, you know, why should this be a problem? Because if everyone is walking at random, then one uh, person's step to the left should be cancelled out by one person's step to the right, and it's going to be completely chaotic. And many independent events, many, many independent uh, events, uh, if you multiply them, the probability that everyone ends up walking in step is going to be close to zero. So we know, for example, that soldiers have to break their step when they cross a bridge for exactly the reason that, you know, there doesn't, uh, you know, you don't want to have this concerted movement. So, yeah, so the question is, what is the probability that a thousand people uh, walking at random end up walking exactly in step and remain in lockstep thereafter? Now, it's very tempting to say zero because, you know, by definition, these are, you know, if you treat them as, a, as independent events, they should not lead to this uh, lockstep. But um, what turns out is that uh, the bridge itself is a very effective coordination device. Because, you know, as you saw in the video, it was a fairly windy day. And so when the bridge moves slightly, you know, it's very natural for people to adjust their stance to regain their balance. But the problem is that when people adjust their stance, they do it all together, all at the same time, because they're reacting to the bridge. So the bridge itself is a coordination device. And because everyone is moving in unison, that actually moves the bridge itself. But if that's the case, then everyone is now tilted too much uh, on the other side. And so everyone then adjusts their stance in the opposite direction. But then, that means that uh, this is going to push the bridge, which then uh, elicits the next step and so on. So what we have is a classic feedback loop. So once the bridge moves, everyone adjusts their stance, that pushes the bridge, which further adjusts the stance. And now you're in lockstep. And this is, and this is the essence of you know, what we're talking about uh, and what John's book is talking about. This is not like a meteor strike. It's not like a storm that's going to hit this bridge. Uh, it's not like a you know three standard deviation event that we throw, uh, you know, at the bridge. It's actually something that's generated by the participants in the system itself. So um, if you think about the analogy, this feedback loop between the bridge moving and pedestrians adjusting their stance is exactly. Um, applicable when we think about financial markets. So think about, of course, uh, the 2008 crisis, but, um, you know, when John and I were writing our paper, 
on endogenous risk. You know, our our uh, you know main motivating example was the 1998 um, crisis that was associated with uh, LTCM with uh, um, long-term capital management and the unraveling of the portfolio of uh, of the relative value trades that LTCM was engaged in. And in just the way in just the way that the bridge moving is a coordination device, of course the, the market itself is an amazingly good coordination device. When prices move, it actually elicits actions as well as simply being a signal. Uh, if you're using a risk model, uh, you know that's going to have an effect on how your measured risks change and it's going to elicit actions. And as John said, um, it's the perfectly reasonable individual response to changes in your risk measures that ultimately uh, is going to you know, elicit systemic stress. And so one of the things that we, we wrote about was this uh, dual role of market prices. It's on the one hand, clearly a reflection of the fundamentals. But uh, you know, unlike in a competitive equilibrium where you know that's um, uh, that's its primary role, and in setting the budget constraint here, it actually forces you to do things. Now, um, this is of course a very uh, old example, uh, and I've uh, you know shown you these very old examples. But there is actually a very um, you know current uh, and very topical issue right now, which is the electricity market. I'm sure you're you're following what's going on in the electricity markets. And uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, the rise in natural gas prices, uh, the shutting off of uh, of the gas pipeline, that's clearly had a big impact uh, on European energy markets. What's going on in electricity markets is actually very, very, uh, it's a very good example of what I've just talked about. Hit there, in a way, it's because the electricity producers have hedged. It's the hedging that has elicited those actions. So if you pre-sell the electricity, you know, that's a very um, you know, understandable and very prudent action to do. Um, so you're going short uh, some of the forward, uh, you know, you're going short in the futures contracts. But what we've seen is that as the price of electricity has skyrocketed and as the volatility has gone up, the daily margins have also gone up as well. And what that means is that there is now a maturity mismatch because that margin has to be paid at the end of the day. Uh, but you're going to sell your electricity sometime down the road. So, you, you know, you're, you're potentially solvent. I mean, you're you know, perfectly solvent if you can sell your energy. But if the daily margin has just shot up, you know, that's something that has to be paid right away. So it's as if, uh, you know, there's been a you know, short term liability that has uh, just materialized, just crystallized. And these are examples where I think, um, uh, you know, it's the perfectly reasonable, perfectly prudent actions of individual participants, you know, that actually, um, you know, elicit this kind of systemic reactions. I would actually um, draw a somewhat different set of conclusions from the ones that uh, John actually uh, put up. I mean, I certainly agree with the diagnosis. Um, what I would say is that, uh, um, you know, uh, and I completely you know, ha have a lot of sympathy with, uh, with the general thrust of the book, this illusion of control, and the fact that uh, typically we're you know, working with the measured risks at the time. So when, risk is, when measured risks are low, and measured risks uh, are also prices, uh, it's important to bear that in mind. For VIX, uh, these are the kind of you know volatility measures, especially when they're traded. These are market prices, and therefore, when those prices uh, indicate very low risk, that's when the problems might arise. I think this is where the regulation really has to be coming in in a way that actually provides some guidance that sometimes second guesses the market price. So, if measured price, if measured risks, therefore market prices say that there's no risk in the future, then I think it's the job of uh, the regulators, it's the job of academics, it's the job of commentators to be somewhat skeptical of that. Say, well, to what extent is this actually purely a reflection of risk appetite 
and distorted incentives that are in the system? And to what extent can we really trust, you know, those prices? And how would we actually put the, put that skepticism into practice? Well, I think that's where we would need to have, you know, rules that ensure that uh, we have smoothing across time. So even if prices suggest that you can really skimp on margins and you can really make margins razor thin during times of tranquility, well, perhaps we should um, be a little bit skeptical of that. Now, this, uh, this approach goes by the name of anti-pro-cyclicality. So it's one of those kind of, you know, it's a, it's a regulator's word. Uh, it's, it's much discussed. Uh, you know, pro-cyclicality is this, uh, this idea that, you know, we have low measured risks followed by very high realized risks. Anti-pro-cyclicality is, if you like, leaning against uh, the trends. And I think what uh, we saw certainly during March 2020 episode, and now what we're, uh, uh, and what we saw in February uh, with the Russian invasion and the, and the commodity uh, stress that we saw then, and now what we're witnessing uh, in much more serious form in the electricity markets, I think really does underscore the ideas in this book and the idea of the importance of anti-procyclicality. Thank you, Yuna, for this brilliant uh, discussion. I really like the comparison you did with the Millennium Bridge. This was really illuminating and so true in a way. So this was really fantastic. I know, John, if you want to reply to Yuna first and then we go to the discussion and the question. Yuna's comment were absolutely excellent. And I think we should just proceed on to the question to see what the audience thinks. Let me start with Matteo Filina, who writes, do you think that the financial system should have different degrees of resilience for endogenous and exogenous risk? This was actually also one of the questions I had. And if so, why? And second, could you elaborate a bit on what dimension of diversity you think are important? On the first question, so I think it's important to recognize that what this risk depends on who you are and what you want to achieve. We have this tendency to say, we have a measurement of risk and it applies to everything we care about. But of course, some of us might care about a pension 50 years into the future. Others might care about covering our losses for the next day. So what is risk really depends on who you are, your objective, your time horizon. The people who care about exogenous risk are people with a high frequency day-to-day -day outlook. So market traders and banks and people, day traders and people like that. By and large, I think the financial authorities, they, they, they shouldn't concern themselves with exogenous risk because basically it's a dimensional risk that is irrelevant to the problem. So when we think about resiliency, we should be thinking about resiliency against exogenous risk and let the market participants care about exogenous risk to the extent it matters to them. So on what the dimension of diversity I, th I think are important is, and I think this is here where I disagree a little bit with Hume, because I'm more skeptical as to the ability of anybody to do something procyclical, because what we are seeing now, I think, is an example of what's supposed to be an anti-cyclical policy intervention is turning into highly pro-cyclical inflation. So, 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 so the, because the timing is so difficult that trying to actively be anti-cyclical is actually much harder to, than one thinks. So the dimension of diversity, I think, is most important is to try to find a way to create financial institutions that provide financial services, intermediation and the like, but are objectively different than the large banks we have today. So almost one should say we should try to have institutions that are different than the banks that we have encouraged so strongly over the past years and decades. But let me push back a little bit to you. So this exogenous and endogenous also, how should I think about it? So if I think of the shock in uh, the Ukraine shock, for example, that is clearly an exogenous uh, risk as a starting at least. Yeah. Then if I follow you, that becomes an endogenous risk because of the reaction and because of what happened on the commodity market. 
<laughs> so what should be the objective of a regulation in a way? Should that be to try to make the system, whether it's banks or other institutions, we can go back to this diversity story, resilient to what? To the exogenous or to the endogenous response that comes from that? I think the Ukraine invention really crystallizes the problem. And in some ways, I really wish I could have delayed the book by a year to discuss exactly that case. Because obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a purely exogenous shock. So is COVID. But what is interesting about both of these things is how we endogenously react to the shocks. That's what matters. So therefore, if I'm a financial authority, I would say when a shock happens, how does the market react to the shocks? So that's how you build resiliency. So if you can somehow create a structure that makes the market participants act counter cyclically or at, the, at least damp or dampen out the shock. So take the Millennium Bridge example Hume gave, which is the solution was to dampen the shocks, but the, 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 the engineers could also have just introduced noise in the system. It would have achieved exactly the same thing and be more interesting from an economic point of view. So. The, the way you, you, instead of trying to measure this, this type of risk, which I think is basically practically impossible, you can make an institution or force institutions to build resiliency because ultimately, I think all financial crises are at the core the same. They all have the same deep economic factors. And if you think about it that way, you can then say, if a shock happens, it doesn't really matter whether it's COVID or Ukraine, we know the banks react to them in a particular way, and then you can figure out how to make them resilient against them. Jon, would you think the same? That what really matters is to try to prevent or to deal more with the endogenous reaction and not to the exogenous. So how should I think about but because margin calls is one issue, but how should I think about the potential upcoming recession? Is that endogenous? Is that exogenous? What is it? And at least it's, well, it's not endogenous to the financial institutions or financial system yeah. itself, right? So the shocks are big as well, definitely. Yeah. I don't know. Um, you know, on the diversity point, and I think this is where um, I think we have to be, I think, uh, uh, you know, clear about what, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, aspects of diversity are in the control of policymakers or other people who actually have influence in the market structure and what elements of diversity are things that will actually spring, um, from the very nature of the markets. Now, the, by very, by the very nature of rules, um, you know, they tend to have, uh, certain, you know, imperatives that, uh, you know, lead you to, to certain, well, you know, they will have guard, uh, rails so that uh, it prevents you from doing certain things. You will end up, you know, at different points on the possibility frontier, but it's very difficult to Im imagine rules that say, you know, you need to be diverse. <laughs> and the only way to actually enforce that is to say. Well, you know, you have to do X, Y, and Z, whereas the other person has to do, uh, you know, A, B, and C. You have to be very, very, uh, you know, prescriptive at a very granular level. So I think it's, um, it's probably much more, um, I think promising to think about diversity as an outcome that you would like to encourage, uh, from the nature of the business model itself. And I think we know from, uh, I think we know enough about the the industrial organization, um, you know, aspects of these industries, uh, where in some industries, you know, you will have diversity, you know, you, you know, you will have space that's created the strategic effects. Sometimes, uh, you know, you have strategic complements, but otherwise you have strategic substitutes. And when you have strategic substitutes, that's when, uh, you know, you're going to have diversity. So I think it's at that level um, that I think we should be thinking about that. So it's more of a market design issue, I would say, than uh, one about regulation. I think for regulation, um, I think we're far better off at focusing on those things where you know we might have the biggest impact. Now, to what extent was it really, you know, impossible to to buffer some of the shocks that uh, that we have seen? You know, I think at the very least, um, had uh, margins been higher, 
when things were very tranquil, um, I think the shock would have been somewhat less. So, you know, if uh, you're using a value at risk model and the value at risk model says, well, actually the risk is very, very low, you can afford to have razor thin margins. Um, I think that's the kind of conclusion that, uh, you know, we can try and uh, lean against through regulation. And, you know, this is a very familiar theme. And Eleanor, you know this very much from the banking regulation case of looking through the cycle uh, and the whole Basel approach, uh, the Basel capital rules approach is precisely, you know, predicated on trying to look through the cycle. Uh, you know, the, um, the Basel rules are not, you know, uh, as sensitive to the day-to-day -day market uh, conditions as some market risk models uh, that, uh, you know, market intermediaries, you know, would be using for their daily operations. I mean, their incentives are very different, which is, you know, they, they have their the various capital constraints and they uh, want to maximize, you know, whatever objectives that, uh, you know, they're aiming for. For the regulators, it's something different. It's something that allows you to smooth uh, the ups and downs over the cycle. And I think this is where, um, uh, you know, uh, educators like John um, has a very important role to play in highlighting how important um, it is to, to look through that cycle. And it's um, going to be very important for regulators to do that and for the official sector to do this because it is just not in the, you know, it's, it's very unreasonable of, uh, of the official sector of regulators to ask this of the market participants because the market participants, you know, they have their own, their, their own objectives and these risk models were developed to really, uh, you know, pursue their ends. Um, so, you know, if we simply pick those up, you know, pick those models up and then somehow apply them in regulation, that clearly is not the right use of those kind of models. We need to have something which, in the spirit of the Basel rules, uh, which look through the cycle. I agree with that. So let me go to another question from Bernard Delbecq. So what does John think about the attempt of central banks to regulate shadow banks as banks, knowing that bond funds or money market funds are very different institutions than banks? So the, the shadow banking regulation, regulation discussion is a very difficult because it depends very much on where you are in the world. So if you talk about shadow banks in China, it is different than shadow banks in the United States and different from shadow banks in Europe. But we are here in Europe, but not in China and not in the United States. So I always thought that one of the fantastic characteristic of the United States financial markets is that one third of financial intermediation is done by banks. Indeed, if you take the entire US banking sector assets, it's less on GDP. It is four times that in the UK and most of Europe. So that means to most of the US financial system is in that sense, a shadow bank. And I think that makes the United States financial system very resilient and to my mind is the key reason why the United States could react so well to the crisis in 2008. While Europe had to recap all its bank and therefore hold back on SME lending, the United States could leave that much more to the market and therefore they could make the banks strengthen the banks without clamping down on intermediation and lending to the economy. So the trying to the, the term shadow banking as a catch all term, I think is highly dangerous we misleading. Some parts of shadow bankings are absolutely dangerous. Like anything, if you just try to do direct banking activity without oversight, like we've seen in China and with MMMs in the United States, but other parts of shadow banking are highly beneficial to the economy, which is alternative ways of doing financial intermediation. Okay, let me go to another question still from Baron that I know Ernest also has some points to raise, but let me first uh, ask this and then I go to him. John mentioned the responsibilities of policymakers in triggering risk. What about the responsibility of central banks focusing mainly on goods and services price stability? 
How should central banks and supervisory regulators interact to limit risk ex ante and or ex post? That's John and the same I, person also can okay. go to Jun. Okay. I basically take the view that the problem is this is this is you're saying does a regulator have a view in controlling financial market risk? Well, that must presuppose the regulator can measure that risk. Because if you can't measure the risk, how can you control it? And the whole thrust of my argument is the inability to measure the risk that you actually want to control. So th this is why I'm sort of saying, instead of trying to control a f the risk in the systems, I think it's basically almost impossible, try to create a structure or restructure the financial system in which makes you endogenously make the system resilient. So instead of trying to control risk, just try to create a system that makes the system absorb shocks instead of amplifying them. But then if I take this argument to the very extreme, does that mean the financial regulation is sort of unnecessary? Absolutely not. I have never ever anywhere in this claimed that financial regulations is unnecessary. But I mean, if you cannot measure anything in a way, I mean, from, no, from you, what you just we, said. We, we, we need to be careful here about what we are talking about. I said, None of this has anything to do with <laughs> micro-pro. None of this has anything to do with micro-pro. And if you take the thrust of financial regulations, it is micro-pro, it's the bulk of it. And I think by and large, that's beneficial. It is the macro pro dimension I am questioning. And it is not saying we can't regulate, but the authorities can have a view of how to structure the financial system that make it resilient. So certainly we want the Bank of England and the other central banks to think about and actively try to promote shock absorption. And the way you can do that is, I think Hume was exactly spot on. We cannot tell financial institutions to become diverse. It doesn't work. But what we can do is we can allow diverse institutions to emerge. I mean, every single fintech I talked to in London that is dealt with the financial regulators here says, basically the only objective the Bank of England and the FCA is to ban. Nothing is allowed. So therefore, if the attitude of the authorities is just ban, then you will end up with incumbents. So I think the first step would simply be to say how, just for the authorities to say, if you are a new idea with a new business model in the FinTech space or DeFi space or anything else, do what you can to give them a license to operate as a financial institution instead of what we see in effect today, which is do everything you can to prevent them from operating. So I am not proposing you you force diversity, I'm simply, you allow it to happen. Yeah. Let's go to Ernest because I see the time is running a little bit. Please. Yes, um, thank you very much for this excellent discussion, very stimulating and thought provoking. If I may, I have three uh, short points, um, comments, but I'm also very happy to be criticized uh, on them or get feedback. So the first point uh, relates to the slide on the unknown unknowns by Jon. And it, it's obvious uh, that these unknown unknowns are the most difficult area for policymakers. We also experience this now with inflation. So in the financial stability sphere, uh, the obvious answers that would come to me as a central banker is that one way uh, might be to incentivize what we call in the German uh, legal system uh, incentivize caution of a serious business person. You know, a business person in, in German law or in Austrian law is supposed to act in a, in, a, in a cautious, serious way. And I think one key is how to incentivize such behavior. And the second uh, idea would be to create redundance in systems, backups, contingency plans, and so on, in order to make the system more resilient. I very much subscribe to this idea of building up resilience within systems. I found this very important. My second point uh, relates to uh, the topic of uh, the political risk as a source of, of financial crises. Uh, 
I would go one step far further and call this the endogenousness of political action and political responses to financial crisis. Um, there are even sort of cycles uh, of regulation and supervision in response to experienced crisis. And the problem of legality and the role of the supervisor versus the legislator that Jan uh, mentions in this slide. And uh, it seems to me that this is similar to the problem that is has been addressed for inflation and for central bank independence in relation to monetary policy. So the mandate of the legislator in that case has been limited because of the apparent short-sightedness of policymakers uh, re with regard to inflation. So th this has been delegated to an ind independent central bank. And I think the same logic applies uh, to regulators and supervisors. And this is not new. This has been discussed for the past 20 years. And it has turned out to be very difficult to convince politicians to do the same as for central banks, also for supervisors. They don't want to make supervisors independent. And they don't want to benefit from the maybe longer horizon that supervisors might have. Uh, so that they don't accommodate a housing boom because this is so nice uh, and so on. So independence and long tenure for supervisors and for regulators would be my second point. And the third point is this very interesting point on, on the diversity of financial institutions to create endogenously resilience. Now, I, I find this very good, this argument, but uh, a possible limitation to that is that such diversity makes the financial system even more complex both for supervisors, I can just tell you in central banks, it becomes ever more challenging to supervise ever more complex financial institutions. And if they now also get more diverse, it requires even more skills. And also for the consumers, for the customers, you know, all that diversity of institutions means that the choice, your consumption choice, which financial product you choose becomes more difficult. You need more and more knowledge. So there might be a trade-off between diversity and transparency, and transparency often is regarded as one condition for markets to function well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see that we have a few minutes in principle. So let, why don't I go first to you? Then maybe you take some of the questions in particular. So you nodding on the second one on, uh, on the relation also with the inflation and the supervisor. So I don't know if you want to take that one just as a suggestion. I don't think I have much to add, um, you know, many, many insights to add. Um, but let me tell you what actually, what actually happened to the Millennium Bridge, uh, because what they did, uh, you know, they actually put uh, so-called viscous dampers under the bridge. So, you know, if you remember the video, uh, you can actually, you know, one idea was to drop, uh, you know, a big unsightly pendulum. What they did was actually, they put dampers. Uh, and if you, uh, next time you visit London, and for those of you who are in London, who is, uh, you know, who've joined us, you know, when you, when you go there, take a look underneath and what they've done is they have actually put some shock absorbers under the bridge. I think, um, you know, the, the idea of, uh, having shock absorbers, um, that actually, you know, uh, breaks that circuit, I think is, uh, you know, the lesson that I would draw. And I think the other issues that John raised about institutional design, I think that's probably not something that we can really you know, solve on this, uh, you know, on this panel, but I really would, um, you know, urge you to take a look at his book. I think it's, uh, you know, there are no equations, lots of nice cartoons. Let me give the floor maybe la the last time to John to see whether he wants to pick up some of the points of Ernst. So in the one minute I have, let me respond quickly to Ernst's points, because they're actually quite interesting. So you can't, the problem is on your first point, you cannot separate out a, a, a bad draw from a acceptable distribution from a bad distribution being than in the first place. That is the fundamental problem. And resilience is costly. I mean, it, resilience drives down G GDP. And I have an example in the book where they executed bankers and the bankers still misbehaved even if they got executed. So I sort of, I'm quite, I don't think just forcing them to incentivize caution is going to work. Again, I very much agree with the with your idea of political endogenous risk, but I have one cautionary example about supervisors. So I have a paper on value at risk which says the way 
the micro supervisors chose value at risk in Basel II incentivizes tail risk. So if you just do a basic standard incentive model, theoretic incentive model, you because they target the value at risk point, which drives them to the tail. So you increase systemic risk precisely because micro pro value at risk was imposed. So therefore, if you want to go down this road, I think we would not want to see such cases done again. But on the on your last point, of course, it will make the system more complex. But I think it reduces the impetus for macro proof, so allows you to focus more on the micro proof problem. I think which is much more important. So just some resource allocation would I think make us all better off. Okay, I'm sorry for the remaining chat, the, the main question in the chat that we cannot address, but I believe is time now to finish the seminar. So let me thank again John and Yoon for the insights, John for the most interesting book that we again encourage everyone to read, and Ennis for having, and Donato also for setting up the webinar, and to all the participants for participating. Thank you very much. I don't know if you, Ennis, want to add anything at the end. No? Okay. Yeah, thanks then. to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.